Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is John Darnell, a professor of Egyptology at Yale University. Professor Darnell's interests include Egyptian religion, cryptography, the scripts and texts of Greco-Roman Egypt, and the archaeological and epigraphic remains of ancient activity in the Egyptian Western Desert. He has considerable field experience in Egypt, and his discoveries, including the Scorpion Tableau, which perhaps the earliest historical record of ancient Egypt, as well as the earliest alphabetic inscriptions in the Wadi El Hol, have yielded new insight into ancient Egyptian civilization. Today we'll talk with him about his work in Egypt. Welcome, Professor Darnell. Thank you for the invitation. You are an Egyptologist. That is a term that for me conjures up um, a very romantic notion of, of perhaps an Indiana Jones type character searching for treasure in the desert. Um, I imagine the reality of that is somewhat different. Tell us what it, what it means to be an Egyptologist and what skill set um, that, that's important to have. Well, some things are similar to Indiana Jones, I guess, although I have to say we use brushes and trowels more often than we use bull whips. They're, oh. they're not very helpful, <laughs> actually. Um, for an Egyptologist, really, what we like to stress here at Yale is mm -hmm. the need to understand both the uh, written and the physical remains. Okay. So um, the epigraphic material, all inscribed material, and archaeological remains as, as well. So um, to really to be an Egyptologist of the sort I think that, that we need to see in the modern world would require knowledge of the written material, ability with all the scripts, including the cursive scripts, um, and knowledge of the architecture, the art, the religion, the whole gamut of uh, pharaonic civilization. That seems like quite a bit of knowledge that uh, you have to have, um, particularly language. How did you come to be an Egyptologist? What drew you to it? To answer succinctly, it's really because of my mother. Oh. She grew up on a farm in South Alabama where there were um, Mississippian um, native remains, mounds, etc. She was always interested in archaeology, so when I was very, very little, um, she would read to me primarily out of Egyptological books, mm -hmm. things that were probably a little over my head at the time, to get me to take a nap. And I guess originally unbeknownst to her, I, I wasn't sleeping, I was just listening. And that's really all I ever wanted to do. There was one particular book I remember with a photograph of what I now know to have been the letters of a farmer named Hekanachta who wrote these to his family around 2000 BCE. Mm -hmm. And I would stare at that when I was very, very young and really wanted to be able to read ancient Egyptian. And it never went away. Wow. So now you can read ancient Egyptian. And, and what other... Um what other languages do you need? A, a lot of it is reading symbols, I would imagine, right? Ancient Egyptian is an interesting script. The script of ancient Egypt is interesting because it's a combination uh, of phonetic signs and ideographic signs. So signs that one reads phonetically and signs that one reads as images of the things represented. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a combination. It's the oldest known, oldest surviving, I guess you could say, member of the Hamido-Semitic super family of, of languages. Mm -hmm. As far as we can say now, it is the oldest truly phonetically written script of which we have evidence. It goes back as early as about 3300 BCE. One of the things we've had the fortune, the, the great good fortune to discover are some of the harbingers of the Egyptian script out in the Western Desert, mm -hmm. in the, the rock art of the fifth and the fourth millennia BCE. Okay, and, and how long does it take one to master? I think I can safely say that you probably die <laughs> before you master it. I, I, I'm always telling students, um, Really, I'm not just saying this to make them feel good. That mm -hmm. it just takes years and years and years of acquaintance with it because it's a, it's a, it's a dead language, an archaic offshoot of a language family with which most Western students are not familiar. 
Um, the scripts themselves are rather difficult, evolve over time. Um, there are a number of genres of text with which one must acquaint oneself. So it takes years and years of reading just to have that sort of background mm -hmm. and recognition of parallels that you'll find when looking at one text, the things that trigger the little light bulbs that say, oh, I, I know this, this is an allusion mm -hmm. to this. It, it just, it takes years and, and, and years. Okay. Let's talk about some of your discoveries. What was your first one? I guess the first discovery we made really was the fact that it was possible both to date the ancient caravan routes of the Western Desert and to say something about what the people were doing on those tracks. And, ha and how did you manage to do that? Well, we knew that there were routes through the Western Desert. They're recorded on early maps, older caravan routes that were in use in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. We knew that the ancient Egyptians traveled through the Western Desert, um, but in most Egyptological writings, people would just kind of look on an old map and say, well, maybe they took this route or they took that route. Mm -hmm. And what we really wanted first to see was, you know, is it possible to go on some of these visible tracks in the desert and say, this is a pharaonic track. This was in use in the ancient Egyptian period. This is Roman, this is Christian, this is early Islamic, etc." And what we found was tremendous amounts of archaeological remains on most of these roads. Mm -hmm. uh, broken pottery. When the caravans travel, let's say one person drops a pot every couple of days, uh, a load falls off a donkey. The ancient Egyptians used donkeys primarily as their beasts of burden on the desert roads. Um, Versus camels, that's what I would assume. Camels do not seem to become very significant in Egypt prior to, let's say, the 6th century BCE. Mm -hmm. There's some very, very slim evidence that the Egyptians may have known the camel earlier. Mm -hmm. It only becomes important later because camels, pound for pound, a donkey is a better beast of burden in terms of what they can carry compared to, say, their weight and what they might consume. Mm -hmm. Camels don't need a lot of water really until they say they start off with a lot and they get a lot where they're going. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you realize about the camel trade, the camel caravan traffic, is that a great many of the animals died en route. Um, the medieval caravan roads, I've been on some of them in the Western Desert, they're just littered with the mummified carcasses wow. of, of dead camels. Um, it was very wasteful in terms of the animals. And Camels were used primarily if you knew you weren't going to be able to get provisions in any great quantity between your starting point and your end point. Mm -hmm. So if it's a period of semi-lawlessness in an area, which is the case in southern Egypt for much of the medieval period, um, if you're basically an armed trading party that's getting through both criminal territory and climatically bad areas, if the government's not able to maintain food and water depots, camels are what you want. Mm -hmm. The ancient Egyptians did maintain these sorts of depots, so they used primarily donkey caravans, big donkey trains. Okay, so we were talking about your first discovery, and um, so that must have been very exciting for you, I would imagine, to be able to um, say to the world, you know, what these roots are and with any amount of certainty. It was exciting to realize that there was all this archaeological material mm -hmm. and, and that we really could say something, even about the trade, mm -hmm. that we could look at fragments of imported pottery and you could actually say that uh, wine from the eastern Mediterranean coast was coming out in some quantity out into the Egyptian western desert around 1600 BCE. Uh, that, that was very interesting and important, but one of the even more surprising things, I think, was the fact that we realized um, how many rock inscriptions we would find, how much mm -hmm. written material would be at these sites as well. And since these are unusual sites, out of the way places, traveled both by just common soldiers and trades people, donkey herders, and by generals and higher officials, you get a, a a wide range of 
inscriptions, mm -hmm. names of people, titles. Sometimes they tell you where they're going. Sometimes they tell you where they've been. Um, even some semi-official inscriptions. And many of these have filled in gaps in the historical record. During periods of instability in the Nile Valley, when we don't get the information that we might want in the Nile Valley sites, curiously, the desert sites start to fill in these gaps. Mm -hmm. Because when the central authority breaks down, these hinterlands, these surrounding areas become much more important mm -hmm. because of trade and military roads passing through. Okay. And let's talk about your favorite discovery. I don't want to insult the early alphabetic inscriptions or the Scorpion Tableau or some of these others, but I guess I would say possibly because I'm working on it in depth right now, it would be the, the rock shrine of a priest named Pahu, who lived around 1460 BCE, and he carved a series of prayers and scenes and images in an area of the western desert west of modern Gamula. Okay. And it's, it's very interesting because we, he left us his name and title. We know he's a priest. He's not a very high echelon priest. And he carved only what he really wanted to carve for himself. And in some of the inscriptions, he actually says, made by the priest Pahu for himself, which is a very unusual mm -hmm. thing to find. So we know that this was made as his sort of private place of, of worship. He uses a combination of, of scenes and inscriptions that you would find in a temple and other scenes and texts that are, are completely unusual. It's a complete blend, I guess you would say, of formal and, and informal. And it has huge implications for understanding personal religious feeling of, let's say, a middle-class Egyptian from the time of the New Kingdom. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's really important. It's a very nice little site. Okay, so let's talk about what you do on a on a day to day basis. When you're at that site, what does your day consist of? What do you do? Well, let's say let's say we're camping. Mm -hmm. Many of these sites require us to to camp. So we bring out three meter by three meter, four meter by four meter tents. Um, camp at the site. We have to send back for water and food periodically with the rovers. So basically, you try to get up about sunrise. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the winter, it's really unpleasant to get up when it's nice and frigid and dark and fumble around the tent for everything. But get up and get out, get going um, with sunrise. Mm -hmm. And in the winter, try to work pretty straight through with just a short lunch break because it starts to get dark mm -hmm. pretty early. Um, and are you working with a team of people? What are you, like, dusting things off, digging? What exactly are you doing? I mean, it varies wildly from okay. site to site. So at Pahu's site, primarily we're doing epigraphic recording. We're copying the rock inscriptions. Mm -hmm. So begin with making documentary photographs with scales, um, squared up to the rock face with the camera as well as you can. Um, make tracings using plastic and sharpies, etc. Um, these are copied either back at our Luxor headquarters or back in the States. Mm -hmm. Then in a subsequent season at each site, we're doing a combination of making fresh copies and checking our initial inkings of the earlier copies. Because the real important thing is not simply to make a copy, but to go back and check it at the rock face as often as possible to make sure that you've got every bit of information mm -hmm. that you can get. At other sites, we're clearing debris. One of the great things about desert sites is everything that anybody ever dropped there, unless somebody else came along and picked it up, it's still there mm -hmm. on the surface. And some of the sites show considerable accumulation of, of debris. We have huge caravan stops where we have debris mounds that are thousands of cubic meters of debris, combinations of broken pottery, objects people dropped, animal dung that's been sort of shoveled up into these mounds to mm -hmm. keep it from, say, blowing around where people are working and, and living. Um, so clearing through that material, sifting through it, quantifying the material, very often we have groups of graduate students coming out at one of the sites at the Umawajir site in Harga, this requires sorting of fabrics. So um, different types of pots may be made out of different types of clays. Mm -hmm. And if you can count them up and weigh them, um, you can quantify how many bowls 
and what weight of bowls, how many jars and what weight of jars mm -hmm. and what types of fabrics. And it can be very instructive then to compare this quantified data between the levels. Mm -hmm. Because you can say sometimes by doing that, wow, something really changed at this period. Totally different types of pots, different ratios. At the Umawajir site, what we found was that it was remarkably uniform what they were doing and how they were doing it. So the, the baking process, let's say at this one site, we realized was done in a really, I guess you could say, almost automated fashion. Like same types of pots in the same ratios, same types of clays in the same ratios, doing the same thing over about a, a century. So some sites, there are just a couple of us working on wrapping up, copying rock inscriptions. Other times we may have um, a dozen uh, students and uh, associated people like paleobotanists, et cetera, with us. And we also have um, a permanent staff of Egyptian workmen mm -hmm. who've worked with us now for years and who really understand the excavation techniques that you need in the desert. Okay. One of the weird things in the desert, by the way, is mm -hmm. you know if you're digging in soil, if you're in the Nile Valley, you're going through a matrix trying to find the objects in that matrix. Mm -hmm. In the desert, at these activity sites, these living sites, these caravanserais, there's no soil, so the entire matrix is also archaeological material. So it's a completely different sort of, of technique that you're not looking for objects in a matrix. You're actually going through, I don't know how, what you'd call it, like an artifactual matrix mm -hmm. trying to quantify the material, trying to see how the site formed, that sort of thing. It must take forever. I mean, is it a very lengthy process? Pro is it a very lengthy process? I mean, are you working on a project for years and years? Or I, I would imagine it does vary depending on where you are, but it seems like it would take forever to like clear the sand off of something, for instance. It can, it can take a tremendous amount of time. Uh, one of our interesting discoveries at a site called Tumdaba between the Nile Valley and Karga Oasis was a cistern that had been dug around in its final form around 1550, 1600 BCE. Mm -hmm. It was about 100 feet deep, dug through initially an upper level of sort of fossil alluvial soil that had filled a depression in remote antiquity in the high desert plateau. Mm -hmm. They dug through that, a big spiral staircase, and then a shaft in two major segments down through the limestone mm -hmm. to gather rainwater that would fall in this depression. It was about 100 feet deep, and it really was very difficult to, to clear. We mm -hmm. could only stay on site for about a month at a time before it really became rather difficult to keep the vehicles in repair mm -hmm. and because they have to keep going back and forth to, to bring in supplies. Um, we would dig it as deep, and clear it as deeply as we could of sand in continuing to work on the surrounding area, come back the next year and about three to four meters of sand would fill in then in the intervening time. So you'd go down, sand would build up a little bit, go back down, sand would build up a little bit. Um, that's a problem at a lot of the sites. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is sort of triage, um, clearing of random areas in a larger site is, is a necessary initial process mm -hmm. anyway so that you can be absolutely certain that you're really getting a good snapshot, that, that you're not just letting your eyes be attracted and say, that's the highest part, I just, I'm just gonna concentrate on the highest part. You really have to try to be a combination of selective, going for areas that you think probably would be important, and at the same time, making sure that you're picking randomly in your grid mm -hmm. certain areas to clear. And um, usually after a few seasons, you, you you get an idea as to whether you've gotten most of the data mm -hmm. that you'll get from that. One site. of the things that I have um, heard about and, and read is that there are thieves and vandals. Have you experienced that? And since you do go back repeatedly year after year to sites, have you had any you know heartbreak in that area, for instance? We do encounter vandals. Um, we do encounter land reclamation, even in some of the more remote parts of the desert. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very sad, depressing thing to have happen. Um, one of the sites at which we've worked for a number of seasons, the Wadi Hole, um, was being vandalized 
uh, when we first got to the site, um, thieves were already attacking the site. Um, we've done our best to try to protect the area, um, but as in most things, it's easier to go out and to destroy something than it is to record it. And one of the very important inscriptions in the Wadi Al-Hol, um, a letter that was carved by a priest addressed to another priest, but carved on the rock face. So probably the only sort of monumental lapidary spontaneous letter like that from ancient Egypt that also quoted from the story of Sinue. This is also one of, actually I forget about this always, this is actually a rather interesting discovery. It, it's just a person traveling this road. He's a priest. He's writing to another priest who had left his inscription close by. So it's this kind of joke in a way, I guess he knows this man's going to come by and he'll see his letter. But in his letter, he quotes from the story of Sinue, a literary text. So it shows not only that this man, Dedu Sobek, had read the story of Sinue, so he's the earliest person whose name we know who read the story of Sinue. Um, he also was able to quote from this literary text. That inscription was destroyed shortly after we recorded it. So it's depressing on the one hand. On the other hand, you realize that really the best way to save any site anywhere is really to record it mm -hmm. properly, the archaeological and the epigraphic material. Another thing I'm very interested in now is how do you determine where to go? You know, how do you pick your sites and is there competition for some of the better sites from, you know, other countries and other schools around around the world? How does I get that there, worked there, out? There's competition now and then. We've had, let's say, people from rather marginal places try occasionally to take over a site, mm -hmm. um, just pretending that, oh, they had no idea that there was something there, etc. Um, the Egyptian Antiquities Organization is generally pretty good at figuring that out. Um, so I've been contacted several times by them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're erring on the side of caution and I've been able to say, oh, no, that, that's really not a problem, but, but thank you. Um, fortunately for us, we're in an area that's been rather neglected in a way. Some of the more remote western deserts, southwestern desert areas, have been investigated heavily now um, for early prehistoric material. And the Nile Valley, of course, and, and I don't mean to belittle the Nile Valley. No matter how much work you do in the Nile Valley, there's always that much more still to be done. Mm -hmm. But the area between the Nile Valley Karga Oasis and the region of Toshka in the southern Egyptian Nile Valley. This is a triangle that's crisscrossed by, by many very important ancient Egyptian roads that were in use in the pre-dynastic and the historical period, on which really we're basically the only people who were working. Mm -hmm. The great thing about working on the road system is that if you're following these ancient tracks, they literally lead you from one site to another site. It's almost like driving down an interstate. I mean, mm -hmm. there's an exit here, there's a little stop there. Um, as long as you keep searching the hinterlands of the road, just to make sure that this site really is on the road and, and, and you're not missing something else about the surrounding area, it literally is like driving down the street. You just we're just led from from site to site. Okay. Final question. And I have to say I could talk to you all day about oh, this. It's been thank you. really very interesting. Um, what would be the holy grail for you if you could make some discovery within the realm of um, possibility? Of course, what would it be? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is a difficult question to answer. I mean, I guess what I would say in, to presage my answer, I would say that we've already found so many things that I would never have guessed that we might find. Mm -hmm. Like one of the inscriptions at a site between uh, Luxor and Nag Hammadi out in the Western Desert was an inscription by one of the local governors around 2100 BCE during a time of civil war, mm -hmm. talking about how he made an improvement to that desert road because his, his enemy to the south had annexed the desert. And he refers in this inscription, it's very fragmentary, he refers to warfare and it's the only surviving inscription that really refers to this conflict between ancient Thebes, modern Luxor, 
and the district or gnome, as the Egyptians call it, just to the north. And, and if, if, if somebody had said, you know, this is probably out there, I, I would have rather doubted it. And it would have been the last thing I would have thought, let's say, to find. One of the things I'm always telling the students that I would like to find um, is an inscription of the second intermediate period of the 17th dynasty of King Sekinen Ra, who we know fought these this coalition of Egyptian collaborators and foreign invaders in the north during a time of a weak central authority. We know that Sekin and Ra died in battle, and we have a great historical inscription of his successor, Kamoza. Mm -hmm. So one of the great things to find, obviously, would be the, the Sekin and Ra stila, or an mm -hmm. inscription of Sekin and Ra. Um, that's one thing that would be, would be very nice to find. Well, this has been very fascinating. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you again for the invitation. For more information about Professor Darnell and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.